testing. Oh, okay. Is David here? Good. I, those, you can keep those there. You're not my way. You're going to do your prayer. Okay. You're not my way. I have what I need up here. Is this the first in the series? It is. And I'm doing this one on the Baptist Freedom. Baptist Freedom. Historic and Cooperative Baptist Freedom. Okay. Okay? Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Tonight is religious liberty. Forget liberty.
It's so very good to see you this evening. Grateful for your presence here and this time together. We'll take a few minutes to stop and give thanks for our meal. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the food that we've enjoyed together, for the hands that have prepared it, for the provisions each and every week that are made in this place for times of fellowship that enrich our lives. We're so very grateful for the fellowship around these tables. We ask your blessing upon the remainder of this evening. And now we open our hearts to you as we consider the prayer concerns of our church. Just bless this time and the time that follows. In Jesus' name, amen. There are several prayer concerns that I need to share with you tonight. And before I begin that, I also need to share a couple of announcements. This is the week of the men's prayer luncheon. It will be at the Magnolia Room at 1130. I think we gather about 11-ish uh, on, oh no, it's 1130 now. It moved from 11 to 1130 on Thursday at the Magnolia Room. If you plan to be there, we need a count. And so please let Martha Abner know that count and uh, we'll plan accordingly. We also need to announce, you probably have seen the flyers on the table. We're doing a series of uh, day trips to uh, sacred spaces in the Atlanta area. And uh, our first one was last month when we went to the Basilica in downtown Atlanta. And uh, next week we will be going to the Greek Orthodox Cathedral of the Annunciation. And uh, that will be on April 18. We need for everyone to register so that we can plan the food and the transportation. We'll, tour, we'll leave here around 10 and arrive at the, at the uh, cathedral 10.30 to 11 and uh, then tour the, the cathedral. And uh, we ask that you make reservations, fill out a reservation form, and, and the lunch is $17 a person. But uh, that registration needs to be in the office no later than Monday, uh, April 15th. And if you can do it before, we, we really need to know the count to plan the food. So help us with that if you can. Um, and encourage those in your Sunday school classes. There's a few registration forms on the table. There are some up here on the stage, and they're available through the church office as well. Martha's here for a while. If you want to, she, she always tells me that it's okay to tell them to uh, turn, turn it in to me if you want to. So, uh, Martha, thank you for all that you do for all of us. Let me share now our prayer concerns. Uh, this has been a, a pretty significant week for Brian and Donna Weatherby. Uh, Brian Weatherby uh, will see the urologist on Friday morning, and uh, he will have the stent removed, and hopefully that will end all of his visits to that particular doctor for a while or end it. Uh, but uh, last week's chemotherapy and immunotherapy treatments went very well, as well as to be expected, Brian said. And so round two of the chemo and immunotherapy treatments uh, it will be next week. And the way it goes is Tuesday through Thursday, uh, they will uh, be given via a, a chemo pump that Brian wears uh, during that Tuesday to Thursday time period, then has a week to recover from that, and it's back on for another uh, two-week stint or two-week session. There are six of those sessions, and the second one will start next week. So be remembering Brian and Donna in your prayers. And also, April 18th of next week is the due date for their first grandchild, a granddaughter, who is on the way, and uh, so be in prayer for that. If she has not decided to be here by the 18th, they're going to induce on the 19th. And uh, so Brian and Donna are watching that very carefully because they would like to travel and be with uh, their family in the celebration of that first grandchild. So uh, time to really be praying for them and all these things going on in their life. 
Lynn Buckhalt is at Emory University Hospital. Bart visited her today and learned that she expects to be there uh, probably through the weekend and then uh, going to rehab for about 21 days, they're saying at this point. And she very much appreciates the uh, support that she's been receiving from friends at Smoke Rise. Floyd Fawcett uh, was also in Emory Decatur Hospital today, and when Bart was there, he learned that he was being discharged today. Uh, his issues were related to adjusting medication, and uh, he will be returning home to Park Springs. Lois Breck is also in rehab at Del Mar Gardens, and I visited with her late this afternoon. Uh, she said, Jim, I'm not well, and and I'm very much in need of your prayers. And it's not only related to her physical situation, but Lois lost uh, her granddaughter, uh, Sophia Pozo, husband died. He was killed in an automobile accident yesterday. And uh, not only he, but his cousin, who was the driver of the vehicle, uh, were both uh, killed in that automobile accident. Sophie's husband, who died is the 22-year-old father of that great-grandson that she has been so excited about. You've, if you're like me, you've probably already seen some pictures. And uh, uh, Lois has been so excited about being a great-grandmother, and that little great-grandson has now lost his father in that automobile accident. In addition to that, Sophia is expecting again, and the next baby is due November in November. So a lot to pray about in that family, a very sad time, a very difficult time for our friend Lois Breck and, and her family. Uh, Larry Dodson requests prayer for a friend's granddaughter who had ACL surgery and is a lacrosse player. And he said, we need to pray for this young lady. Jan Gary and Judy Fowler's stepniece Meredith has been in a Daytona Beach hospital and has transferred to an Orlando hospital uh, many of you know her brother, uh, Jan and Judy's brother, Rick, and this is his daughter. She is in a very serious condition in ICU now in the hospital in Orlando. Wendell Tudor is making some very good progress, some very positive progress in rehab this week. We are receiving some upbeat reports and grateful for that. There are several others that I would mention uh, to remember, and let me just call some names. Ron Sykes, John Edson, Apollina Whitney, Millie Jenkins, Sue Sharp, Drew Rauch. I was so happy to see Drew here earlier tonight, but he's still in treatment. Rick Reed, Jim Wainer, Grant Gibbons, Diane Richards, and Diane was here for worship on Sunday. We're so glad to see Diane and Scott. Judy and Hugh Buck, uh, Buchanan. Bob Burkett. Dottie Robinson. Dottie will begin a new treatment perhaps even as early as this Friday. And uh, uh, she's excited about uh, and prayerful about you know, going through a new type of treatment in the days ahead. Victoria Crosby has requested uh, prayer for her son Daryl. Craig Klesson uh, continues to be on our prayer list, but he has received a very good report on the pathology from his surgery, and we're grateful that he's got those good reports. Marty Newcomb Thompson, Terry Bates, Glenda Jones, Marcia Pittard, Carol Gaines continue to be on the prayer list. We also want to remember the family of Jeanette Hatcher, whose memorial service was today in our chapel. Our pastor uh, officiated at that service, and Danny sang, and it was a beautiful service. Uh, the joy class was there in a good number uh, in support of the family, and, and it was a sweet time of memorial for Jeanette Hatcher. Let me also mention the names of those in our congregation who are in hospice care. This is a very special group, and not only this group, but their caregivers. Uh, Dee Dee Poss, Philip Merrill, Jeannie Duval, John Roark, and Elaine Hadley. Let's remember these in prayer together. Once again, gracious God, we bow before you. 
Lord, we don't want to just check off the list that we have prayed, that we've named names. We bring these individuals to you knowing that their lives are in your hands each and every day. Lord, we, we pray for your healing touch, for the power of your spirit, for your guidance, for your peace, for the strength that you can give to those who are so tired and who need extra strength just to go on. Lord, for so many on this list, we pray that they would be encouraged and that somehow those providing care to these loved ones would also be encouraged and strengthened. Lord, we look to you for all that we need, and we do not want to take it for granted. God, it's by your grace, by your mighty power, that so many good things happen, and we are witness to those things. We ask a special touch for Lois and her family. Lord, we're so burdened as we pray for them tonight. We pray for Brian Weatherby and for Donna, for that precious baby on the way. God, we know that you are providing all that they need every day, and we thank you for that. Pray for Wendell and Elaine. We pray for Lynn Buckholt, for all the other many names that have been mentioned tonight. We lift them up to your power and your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen. We are starting a new series on uh, some Baptist distinctives, and uh, Bart is the first up to bat in this series. I think it's going to be good, and uh, he's going to come share with us tonight. Very good. All right. Well, I guess the, the choir is meeting tonight, so their religious education is going to suffer considerably. But that will be okay. We'll, be, we'll, uh, we'll pray for them separate. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we are going to do... Uh, David, you've got the slideshow here. It's not really a slideshow. It's a cue for me. <laughs> But you'll get to see the cues. That makes it easier to remember. <laughs> so this will be good. Nothing fancy uh, today. Uh, but, uh, but I want to take you through a presentation of religious liberty. Um, it's really not a Bible study. I bought my Bible just in case somebody calls out Scripture and we have to look it up. So uh, if you feel so moved by the Spirit, we'll do what we can. But, uh, uh, but I will reference the Scripture generally tonight. And not a traditional Bible study. Because there's much that can be said, and you forget too. Don't forget, I'm a retired attorney, so <laughs> I get fired up about this stuff. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, and we'll talk about that. We're going to start by defining religious liberty, and I'm going to give you the definition that that I prefer, that I like for religious liberty. And so, I'll let admit my bias. That this represents my bias on how we define that. I've heard it illy defined. Um, uh, let me just say this from the outset. This will help us understand where we're going tonight as Baptists. As Baptists, we do not believe religious liberty includes the right to impose ourselves on others if they don't want to be imposed upon, which is the opposite of liberty. But there's some folks that will say that we've curtailed their religious liberty because we've, t we've told them <laughs> that they can't compel others to think what they think. <laughs> You know, uh, and, uh, and, and this, of course, is the opposite of the definition that we want to start with. Um, and uh, uh, let me also say that, that, that I speak out of someone who, who um, if there's any propaganda I believe that, is, that has its own propaganda, it comes out of the uh, historic Baptist and cooperative Baptist tradition. It just does. I am so steeped in it, in my own thinking, and in my own background, and have heard so many presentations on it, and have hung out with so many people who are like-minded, that I can barely think about it any other way. 
<laughs> okay. And that could be to my detriment at times because I don't hear other voices often because I just don't hear, I, I haven't been, it's been so long since I've listened to any other voice on these matters. Uh, but I'm very steeped in that. And I have taught in those um, circles for a very long time, since I was very young, since in my earliest time in, co in college, uh, taught about these things and talked about these things. And they were taught to me uh, when I was in high school. Uh, in fact, 11th grader in high school, one of our Sunday school leaders in my little Southern Baptist church, the, my dad's church in Port Salerno, it's Port, Port Salerno, Salerno Road Baptist Church in Port Salerno, Florida, which is in Stewart, Florida, in South Florida. And we decided that the youth needed to know about the Baptist faith and message. And we found most of it very boring. Uh, but we, the part on religious liberty just blew our mind, <laughs> you know, uh, because we were raised a little more strict, if you will, in, in, in certain periods of my life. And I thought, oh, I didn't even know we believe this, <laughs> you know, and, and I was, you know, I was looking at, at, at these things and, and it, it was exciting to us to think that we really were free to dissent. And of course, we immediately, uh, especially when the parts on soul freedom, my brother and I were quick to let our dad know, well, you know, we can disagree with the pastor. He's like, now I'm your father. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, but it says here in the, it's in the Baptist faith and message. It's a 1963 Baptist faith and message. So, um, so we were exposed to that. Um, and, uh, and it really was exciting. Now, here's why it's exciting. Because Baptists do believe in freedom. They truly do and historically have. And Baptists have bled for this. I mean, they have literally bled for it, Perse been persecuted for this. It's hard-fought freedom, and we know what that means, uh, and, and it's important. And Baptists, at times when other denominations thought they had it right, Baptists have corrected them. Let me just be so bold as to say that. We have corrected other denominations on these matters at times uh, because they've fallen into other pitfalls. And we've done that by often by defending sometimes denominations and other folks who don't believe what we believe, but defending their rights to believe it anyhow. And they've learned to appreciate us in that capacity. And I think we have a lot to be um, proud of in that tradition. And I'm proud to be in that. And I defend that when people, you know, you know, you know how folks are. They have their own biases about what you are and where you are. And when people hear you're a Baptist minister, oh, you know. They don't realize till they have a religious freedom conversation. Oh, this person's some kind of a strange radical, right? In a way that they don't think, right? <laughs> uh, and you can really surprise people, and uh, and they'll find an ally they didn't know they have often. And so there there are uh, are ways that just on religious freedom and talking about freedom and and the freedoms we're going to discuss the fr the freedoms that Baptists uphold that are ways that you can connect with people in witness. In practical witness, I mean, to say to another person, man, I respect the right of your soul to think something different from me and to say something that's even offensive to me and to, and to hear you and to listen to you. And I hope that you'll listen to me too. What a, there's no better way to have a conversation with someone who's afraid to talk to you, right? Or doesn't think they can get to know you or doesn't think you'll still like them after you talk to them. No better basis than to say, I am going to hear you out whether I agree with you or not. <laughs> uh, that gives people a lot of true freedom to express themselves uh, and to communicate. Now, let's look at religious freedom. <clears throat> religious liberty, and I define it as freedom to believe or exercise and exercise or practice your faith without needless intrusion or hindrance by the government. Now, why do I say needless? Well, there are limits to this. You could claim you're religiously free to do just about anything you want, right? <laughs> you might claim you're religiously free to go harm another person without their consent and say, God told you to do it. Guess what? You don't have the freedom to do that. Not even under our laws and constitution. You don't have any freedom to do that because your freedom ends where their freedom begins. And, and we know that. And so it is needless intrusion or hindrance by the government. There are times the government will intervene. Uh, on behalf uh, 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 of one or another uh, right that someone else has that supersedes your right to do what you think is your religious mandate. Uh, but for the most part, and most of the time, there should be no need uh, for if people are exercising their faith with respect for the rights of others and the shared rights we have with other people, that we would need any intrusion or hindrance by the government. 
in the Western church, this definition is often misunderstood. And that's because, you know, we, we like to think of church sometimes. We, we put our, I do this, I go into church, and immediately my mind goes into the church vacuum. And what I mean by that is I understand everything that's going on at church. But imagine if you've never been to church, ever. You don't know anything about a Baptist church, anything we do, and you came on a Sunday morning and listened to what we do and say. It would all be very strange to you and, and very unusual to you, right? And we go into this sort of vacuum, and we sort of think that this stuff just happens because we read it here or we saw Jesus say, render unto God the things that are God and Caesar's that are Caesar's, and we just all read that the same way and understand it the same way. But there are broader influences than just what you're going to find in the Bible. And, and, and the Bible informs our judgment on religious freedom. But you need to know that in the Western church, the definition of religious freedom has its roots most definitely in the Enlightenment. And that includes ties to Scripture. And often people would proof text Scripture. Even Enlightenment thinkers would, proof, would find their proof text in Scripture for why they think this is a rational, reasonable thing for us to believe and do. Notions of individual autonomy and conscience were, were essential elements of human dignity in Enlightenment values. And many devout, believing Christians and many devout and believing religious people who weren't Christians subscribe to this Enlightenment principle and found a basis for that not only in their religious and holy text, but they found a common language that they could share. And to do that, to do that, they had to have some general tolerance emerge among them to say, even if I don't agree with you, I'm going to at least tolerate you, right? Anyhow, so uh, this is, it's implicit and explicit in many places that you, you, this is chief thing. It's a cherished value, uh, a general tolerance. Um, and, uh, and that was a new idea. And I won't, uh, we won't belabor it tonight. We don't have time to go through all that. But you know the history of the church and even other uh, religious movements in the world have had their, their rough periods on this front uh, where they're killing one another and others. And they're doing it in the name of their God or their deity or whom they claim to follow. Uh, and they're doing it side by side with a state or governmental authority. Um, and uh, a lot, oftentimes you'll get writers who get so frustrated, religious preachers and thinkers and teachers, they'll get so frustrated that they'll sermonize on it and they'll remind people that Jesus himself was crucified by a government authority, okay, and with their consent. And uh, this is a sobering thing to remember, uh, that uh, you can still have a general, general, general tolerance for others and be faithful to uh, your profession of faith and be faithful to what you believe. Um, and this is uh, much better uh, practice uh, than aligning yourself with a governmental authority, which often doesn't answer at all to the God you serve. And in fact, uh, when governmental authorities claim to answer for the God you serve, they usually do it because it's convenient for them to get to do these kinds of things, these kinds of intolerant things to other people. <laughs> uh, that's been my experience in not only my, my own lifetime, but history teaches us this. Uh, let's go to the next slide here, if I'm doing this right. David, you may want to take it for me. There you go. In a truly free state or country, religious liberty includes the freedom to profess or practice religion and the freedom not to practice religion. Uh, uh, and and you, you can't have one without the other. Uh, it would be great if everybody practiced their faith, uh, but uh, it, it, it must include both. Uh, you, that's how far uh, this reaches in a free society, a truly free society. Um, and, uh, and they go together, and you'll, you'll see why in a minute. And in the U.S. Constitution, they go together. I, before we change the slide, um, and you're familiar with this, but I want to make sure I quote it correctly. Um, but the first 16 words of the First Amendment, they have two protections for religion, and here it is. It's, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, right? And so it follows this same kind of logic, right? They're not going to establish religion, which means 
they're not going to force you to practice a religion. Or really, they won't even force you to practice any religion. But they're not going to do that, or we're not going to do that. Collectively, our founding fathers decided that's something we don't want to do. Why? They had fled. Many people had fled religious persecution to come and settle here. And they had seen the consequences of what happens when there's an established religion uh, and an established practice, and we'll see some of that later in the persecution of Baptists, who suffered because there were established religion, established edicts coming from the king, and they didn't want that. Uh, and so that's why it reads uh, the way it does, that you have two clauses. Um, so it, it, it is designed, ultimately, to have a neutrality. Now, can you always have a perfect neutrality? No, right? Because rights come up against other rights, right? Your freedom of religion may come up with, against someone else's freedom of movement or freedom of speech or some other thing. And then there's a balancing of rights that has to take place. And that's how religious liberty cases get to our courts. And sometimes they come out on different sides of things and people debate them and continue to hotly debate them. But ultimately the goal is to have as much neutrality as you can in the civil authority so that people can freely practice. And that's a balancing uh, that takes place over time. And it swings uh, the pendulum, how that's done, uh, depending on who, who, uh, how your courts are organized and, uh, and societal, even just societal changes over time uh, can affect how these things are interpreted and how uh, matters are decided in a legal setting. Um, all right, let's uh, move to the next slide. This is, you know this first quote really well. This is the one that you'll often hear cited by religious freedom people, and this is the one that I'm going to admit to you that gets me excited, uh, but on both sides. It gets me excited on the front that I get frustrated because I'll hear people quote this, and they will quote it uh, as if they are quoting Scripture. Right? I mean, it is a, it's like this is this, this and I had someone tell me, well, it's, it's, it's in there, and they were quote, you know, Thomas Jefferson quoted the Bible. I said, that's in the Bible. No, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> We're going to see there are some consistent, there's a consistent idea in the Bible. But they'll quote it like it's a sacred text. And because they have a passionate view that they hold based on this in some way. And I have passionate views uh, based on this. Uh, and you will have passionate views. It, it's a wonderful text. And when we hear it as Americans, it makes me proud to be an American. I'm like, man, I'm glad our revolutionaries wrote that. <laughs> you know, People quote it all over the world. It's that good. <laughs> and so here it is. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, now that's the first problem with that, we already know, but we won't do that tonight, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I am ready to have a patriotic altar call right now on that one, because <laughs> I believe that. I do. I mean, that, I, I can't. I, that's, that, that's, all, that's all American to me. <laughs> and uh, um, and I, every time I stood in a, a courtroom as an attorney, I believed that. And, and it guided some of my passions. And still to this day, guides a lot of our passions and our patriotism. And so uh, it's a Declaration of Independence. Now, it is largely misunderstood. Largely. And it, it happens more often in religious circles. I cannot tell you how many presentations I've been to where a well-meaning minister decided they were going to give their lecture on America as a Christian nation, and they quoted Thomas Jefferson, and they, they would say, Dear old Thomas Jefferson, Bible-believing Thomas Jefferson, and they'll do that, you know, said it already for us, and we don't believe the creators in charge, and all this. Now, I want to tell you, it does not say, it is self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not say that for a reason. And historically, here, here is what is very true about this statement. Uh, it is widely recognized among historians that Thomas Jefferson, along with other founding fathers of the United States of America, appealed to a broad consensus to defend the endowment of shared rights. Implicit in this consensus was a wide tolerance for varied belief, opinion, and dissent. Jefferson's famous truths endowed by their creator appealed to theists. We would be among theists because we believe in a personal God revealed through Jesus Christ and still present with us in the life of the Holy Spirit in the world. That's what, we, that's what I believe. That's what, that's what Baptists believe. That's what 
Christians all over the world believe. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, and we can believe that and see the word creator, and it has that meaning and that purpose for us. But it also appealed to deists and theists and enlightenment, no, enlightenment notions of natural law, which among the intelligentsia and the, the I don't know how to do it without talking class because it was a classist group of men uh, who were well-educated, who, who debated and argued these matters and did it openly with a high level of tolerance for each other. Um, uh, and did it most of the time civilly, but not always, right? Uh, they still had those shooting things, right? Where they, what do they call them, where they had duels? They still shot each other over things back then. People are still shooting each other over things today. <laughs> but generally, they had these, these civil debates, and they were tolerant of those opinions. But it, it captures a broad, broad consensus. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, not a, quote, Bible-believing Christian along the lines of we would think of that term today. I mean, Jefferson, in fact, wrote his own version of the New Testament, where he took out all the miracle stories because they offended his conscience as an enlightened thinker and included Jesus' ethical teachings. I have a copy of it in my office. If you ever want to read it, you can come by and borrow it. It's called Jefferson's Bible. Okay? It is not the authorized version. <laughs> it is just Jefferson's, Jefferson's say. And he thought it was instructive for children to learn these values of Jesus, that they were uh, indeed, in fact, he used the word eternal once about these values. So. But Jefferson himself would be counted among deist thinkers of the day, and we won't go into deism tonight. Uh, so would have been Franklin and James Madison. So uh, um, just know that there is a broader, a broader reality and intelligentsia uh, among those of our founding fathers. And don't be distracted by people pounding around stuff. It doesn't take away the power of this statement. In fact, go to the next slide. Um, in the Christian tradition, this is a broad statement of rights aligns well with the notion of human dignity set forth in the Hebrew creation story where human beings are created in the image of God. I can't think of a more dignified basis for finding an overlap with Jefferson's sentiment that God creates human beings in God's own image. And then God says of human beings, what does God say of human beings in Genesis 1 that's distinct from everything else that's said in Genesis 1? Everything else is good. What does he say of humans? They are very good. High honor and dignity of humanity, created in the image of God, and, and to do work like God does, good work, right? You should do good work on these days and then rest like God and unite yourself with the Spirit of God on that day of Sabbath and that day of rest that you will continue to do your good work as God does good work in the world. And we're called to do that. We're, we're to be doing what? Good and to be righteous and to do these things. And we can do this because we have that human dignity. And it should be our free right to do so without hindrance from some tyrant or government authority to tell us we can't. Right? And we, we can say that with passion, not only as Americans, but as human beings, as citizens in the world who know the rights that we've been endowed by our Creator. And we believe that just as passionately as a deist would, and I can put it in theist terms because I'm a theist. He was no doubt, by the way, Jefferson, a very intelligent man. Je Je Jefferson was aware of that resonance. Also, he was, con he was conscious of the pervasive deism and how it would res resonate, uh, including Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, others uh, who had written passionately on these matters. And so he is invoking nature's supreme deity without appeal to any religious dogma or doctrine that might have doomed the revolutionary consensus. The other thing, if you realize that and you know that, and you can be just as passionate about believing that and that statement to be true in your life, and you know that you know that, it is okay for you to correct someone who is suddenly deciding that America the Beautiful is written into the Gospels. It is not. It is not. I'll tell you what is written in the Gospels. God so loved the world, right? That he get, for the world. I'll tell you what else is written in the Gospels. The great gathering of nations. And where do they come from in the book of Revelation? Where is that other gathering? Where is that other great throng come from? The great parade in the book of Revelation. The great vision of the consummation of all things. They come from all people and all nations and all tongues everywhere. And Baptists of all people who have sent missionaries all over the world ought to know that. Ought to know that God's, where is God's city on the hill? God's light should shine where? In the hearts of all people. And we want it to be. And we want all nations to be established in God and to respect the dignity of people as Scripture demands.
and as Christ demands. So I, don't get me started. I can, you know, when I get these people who say, well, Jesus, it's all an American thing. It is not. I will assure you it is not. And I love my country. I love my country. But God wants me to love all people. And doesn't want my own love for my country to hamper my ability to reach out and listen to someone else from somewhere else who's not like me. And to learn from them too. So, so don't get me started. I'll get preaching on that. I get I fired up about that. I, mean, I did this in a bar review session one time. Somebody said, Bart, you need to be a preacher, not a lawyer. It turned out they were right. Keep going. Next. Okay, next. Here we go. <laughs> I taught the ethics seminar in Mobile five years running, and I would get off on this. All right, Thomas Jefferson. Here's other things he said, because I need you to know. I need you to know this now, because you're going to be armed and dangerous advocates for religious freedom when you leave here. We want to be militant, but in a good way, in a kind way, right? Okay, here we are. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious religious worship place or ministry whatsoever. There's nothing that feels better if you're talking to someone and they open the door to faith and you're talking to faith about them and then they get hostile toward faith is to say, look, man, I don't care if you go to church or not. (laughs) What? It's your right. It's your freedom. But man, I I, I would love to care about you, right? What a great thing (laughs) that what? You don't care if I go? Yeah, I mean, that's your freedom, man. You know, there's another good way to have a conversation. You don't have to lock heads over that, but we don't you should not be compelled to do that. This is a Thomas Jefferson, same person that said, we're endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. Uh, um, that's the, the reference. If you want the reference where that's written, you can find the rights of Thomas Johnson. Just looks up uh, Johnston's uh, collection on that. It does me no injury for my neighbor to say, there are 20 gods or no gods. That's Thomas Jefferson from the notes on the state of Virginia. That's query 17. You can see the years. Uh, you can find that. By the way, you can find that free. It's in the online National Archives. You can read the whole thing. It's lengthy and largely boring, but it's, it's got this wonderful quote in it. Okay, next. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, a misunderstood and precious principle of the historic and cooperative Baptist. Uh, I've given you, and I'm not gonna, you're not going to have, you're going to take that home. That's homework. All right. This is from J. Brent Walker, who was with the Baptist Joint Committee for many, many years. I met Brent Walker. When I was 20 years old at the Protestant Catholic Dialogue Group in Mobile, so Jez at uh, Spring Hill College, you know Spring Hill College, and uh, and I was one of the student members there, and uh, and I came looking for other student members, and I came with my friend Brian Briggs, who passed away a couple years ago of, of uh, pancreatic cancer. My sweet friend Brian. And uh, we were just students. And we came, we said, where is the student section? And they said, you are the student section. (laughs) And we were officially the only two at the time, members of the Protestant Catholic Dialogue, student members. And we got in, we came because you got in for free. And we were like, well, we want to talk to some Catholics because we were at the Baptist school. And we met a woman named Teresa Brown there. And she ended up coming to our school uh, and applying and doing her degree there. She was a Catholic educator. Anyhow, so wonderful. And she became a nut when she read the school. She was the third MEP student member. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, so uh, I met Brent Walker, and oh, he was so wonderful. And he was such an advocate for so many years. And James Dunn before him, uh, because he worked and was, was mentored by James at the Baptist Joint Committee. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, he gave this presentation and he talked about the separation of church and state. And, uh, and there's such hot words. I mean, you'll say this to some people. They'll go, oh, you must be a communist. And, you know, and, uh, 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 because you believe in the separation of church and state. But what are you talking about, a communist? You know, it's, just, it's nothing to do with communism. So, but there's this rhetoric around separation of church and state that gets religious people fired up. I mean, they'll just say, well, no, I believe that this should be God's country. And I'll say, well, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Whether, we, uh, uh, but let's see what we're talking about. Uh, let let me refer you to the five myths, and I'm going to go through these very briefly. But you can read on this. Myth number one is we don't have separation of church and state in America because those words are not constitution. But I will tell you, if you read the Baptist Faith and Message 1963 and these other matters, it's very clear that as a historic Baptist uh, uh, principle. Uh, historic Baptist, we've championed that. Why we champion that? Because we serve King Jesus, and we are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God, and we do not need a state authority to do our work for us. We rely on God to send us out, 
We also don't want the state to conscript someone else to come to us to meddle in what we're trying to do because it's not their business because we're free people. We're free Baptists. And, and so uh, we defend the rights uh, of others to be free of, of having a, an established state church or religion. So the words are not there. Uh, you'll see where they are there. You'll find the hedge of the wall of separation by Roger Williams, a famous preacher of his day. Even Alexis de Tocqueville, who is the most abused, by the way. He is much abused by those who, who uh, I guess, want to establish Christianity as the official religion of the United States. But even de Tocqueville, and you'll see his quote there, I commend it to you. Is very, uh, you will be a powerful advocate for not, even if you don't like the word separation of church and state, you'll be a powerful advocate of freedom for all people to not have the state tell them what they ought to believe because it's not the state's role. Um, and uh, so, so there we have that. The second myth is we do not need or want separation of church and state because the United States is a Christian nation. Now hear me well on this. Hear me well. Jesus is Lord of my life, and I want Jesus to be Lord of your life. And, and uh, uh, but Jesus himself does not compel, right? Whosoever will, right, let them come. And it is, it, is, it is central to Baptist belief that one must come and one must confess and one must make their own profession and work out their salvation with fear and with trembling. And I tremble at the thought that we would have an established religion. Because then it's going to be, who's Christ? Whose version of Christ am I answering to? Am I answering to, and I'll, we could list any of the presidents, start with the beginning. We'll start with George Washington and go on through to today, so it wouldn't be controversial. I could list them all. But guess what? I don't answer to any of their Christ. Not a one of them. They may worship and claim to worship the Christ that I worship. But my faith in Christ is also personal. It's corporate and personal because I am a Baptist. <laughs> so I'm, you, I'm passionate about this. I was raised to this way. And it's my conscience before God. It's my prayer in that closet. It is my confession I make to God. And it is Christ to whom I confess. Not a priest, not a pastor, not an intermediary. If I confess to one of you, it's because I need somebody to help me make my confession better. <laughs> right? And to make it to God and to be better. But you will not be my judge or my forgiver, right? And we know this. We believe this passionately. And uh, why we would want the state to do our work is beyond us. And, and when the state starts to do the work of the church, it hurts the church because the state will do its work by force and persecution. Jesus himself said, I am not like the rulers of this world who will rule, lord over you and force you to do the things they want you to do. No, I say to you, you must be the least and the first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus turns it on its head. So we'll just we'll leave it at that. All right. Now, myth number three. We have freedom of religion, but not freedom from religion. Uh, uh, people can be free to not have religion. Uh, now, you may be a very religious neighbor, and your, your, other, your neighbor next to you may not be religious at all. Now, they still have to tolerate you. Uh, because you may be just the most religious person in the world around them, and it may get on their nerves, but you're free to do that. And they may be irreligious around you, and that may be get on your nerves, but they're free to be that way. <laughs> they really are. And if they're not free, you're not free. Right? doesn't mean that they might not one day come to you and say, pray with me. I don't have time for this example, but I've had this happen to me. I've had it happen at Starbucks. I, well, I've said it in Sunday school before. Someone who told me, I just don't believe in God. And I, I got to know them for several weeks and had coffee in there. And they had a hard day one day. And I, was, I had just talked to them about their life and other stuff. And they came over. They bent down. And she whispered in my ear, pray for me today. And I stopped and prayed for her right there. You understand? And she was free to go on not believing if she wanted to. But that day, she needed a prayer. So let me tell you. Don't let the state get in the way of that freedom. Uh, because the Spirit will do the work of the Spirit. You don't need the state to do that for you. Now. Finally, 
Uh, well, not finally. Myth four, state, church-state separation only keeps the government from setting up a single national church or showing preference among faith groups, but not from aiding uh, all religions equally. Um, <clears throat> the state just shouldn't be in the business of religion, <laughs> period. They just shouldn't be in that business. That's what it's about. I'll let you read about it. Uh, once they get their foot in the door, uh, they make a mess of it. Um, and have historically. Separation of church state has resulted in God's being kicked out of the public schools and banished from the public square. This is a pet peeve of mine because I have kids in public school, and I want you to know both my children have made their profession of faith and were baptized in this church, and they are professing Christians. Uh, and I know many other professing Christians at school, and they have friends who are professing Christians in other denominations, and they have friends who profess faith in other religions and have other religious uh, commitments and they have friends that are uh, uh, professing in uh, Christian denominations that uh, have beliefs far flung from what we would have that sometimes seem strange to us but they have friends in, in those groups too and they are able to operate in those worlds and uh, this is the world that your children and grandchildren are living in and operating in and you'll say well it seems hard because they have so many choices. Yes, they do. The world is more pluralistic, and there is less uh, 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 consistency among those who believe the same in all the same places. Uh, but you'd be surprised how well children navigate this. They have before and after school religious clubs. Uh, they're able to read. If you went into the building right now at the schools that you would find, it, you'll find Bibles in those, in those libraries as well. Uh, and, and you'll find those alongside books written by atheists and others and any, and any other number of different books and stuff. And children will have access to all of these uh, in the world that, that they live in. Uh, but uh, to presume you can kick God out of anywhere is, is, uh, uh, is not possible. I was in school during the prayer ban in school. Uh, I had a religious group that I was associated with, a club that we had in high school, and I went to that club once a week, and we prayed every time, every morning. And we had our Christian magazine was ordered and placed in the library alongside other magazines, and we ordered it and paid for it ourselves, and they placed it there. And it was a Christian teen magazine, and we read morning devotionals out of it. So, uh, and it was just nobody ever told us we couldn't. And are there times when people get radical on both sides of it, whether it's the right or the left, and they go too far in imposing their will or in stripping religion out? Yeah, there are times. That's why we have courts, and that's why we have cases. And we usually hear about the fight and not the end of the battle. <laughs> so, but, but I can assure you there is a lot of belief and there is unbelief. And, and, and there are all manner uh, of opportunities uh, for people to express and share their faith in our schools. But that is also something that Baptists historically and in recent history, historic Baptists and cooperative Baptists, uh, have been able to make peace with and also continue to, have, to bear witness uh, and be a presence in that. We're running late, so I won't go into all the historical matters, um, uh, the historical examples, but I will say if you will start with the 16th century, if you want to read, uh, excuse me, if you'll go to the 17th century, and you will start with, um, uh, well, no, no, yeah, you, if you have 17th century, early 17th century, and you will start, no, early 16th century, my fault, no, 17th century, start with King James, right, I'm sorry. King James, there you go, I get so fired up. Uh, uh, King James, uh, in that period, and you look up the names Smith, S-M-Y-T-H, uh, you can go to the next slide, keep going, they're on here actually, keep going. David, are you going to switch it for me? There you go. Yeah, if you look at Smith and Thomas Helwes, these are names, if you want to write some of these down, you can, if you want me to email them to you, let me know, I'll email them to you, Leonard Busher. Tells you the place you, these are Baptists, by the way, all these are Baptists. Obadiah Holmes, John Clark, Isaac Bacchus, John Leland, the rights of conscious inalienable. He uses the inalienable word. These are Baptists. You will find very inspiring and powerful words from these, uh, these religious leaders, many of whom were persecuted. One of them, uh, Obadiah Holmes, was taken out and beaten. Uh, because he, he was fighting for the r religious liberty of all people, and he's a Baptist. So uh, you, you will find that instructive as well. Go to the next slide. I'm going to close with something positive. 
in the last few minutes since the choir has already left. I'm going to give you two more minutes. This is about preserving and promoting religious freedom. And I like to do a practical thing, so I'm just not beating you overhead with all these historic Baptist separation of church and state stuff. You can read about that stuff. Uh, but here's the way I think you promote religious freedom, and you do it in a biblical and positive and practical sense. And I have to remind myself of this because I'm a passionate person. I'm one of those people, when you watch the news, do you get angry? I have to stop watching the news. I get angry. It doesn't matter what my position is, and my positions will change on stuff, and I'll be just as passionate on what it changed to, and then I, I can't function. And then I realize, well, who am I angry at? How have I changed the world now, sitting here angry about this? What can I do to fix this? Well, the answer is usually nothing, because <laughs> I don't have the ear of my congressperson, because I don't have enough money to get their ear, right? So, uh, but listen, uh, preserving and promoting religious freedom, you can do this by loving your neighbor as yourself. You really can, because you encourage neighborliness. And good neighbors are free neighbors, and neighbors who treat each other as free citizens, even when you disagree with them. You won't agree with them, by the way, on everything. If you do, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> you know. uh, promote shepherd model leadership. This is true both in our, the way that we talk to our children about civics. When I talk to my children about civics and citizenship, I will never do it without talking about shepherd model leadership because they're not teaching this in school. They'll teach them civic history. And my kids will say, gosh, why were all these people constantly killing each other? That's what they learn about history. People have been killing each other everywhere. They learn about all the wars, right, and the dates of the wars. And I'll say, man, I wish we had a religious history uh, or, or a history where we could teach the neighborliness of people that happens every day. That's the real history. It's happening all around you every day. You're safe and sound in your place because you have neighbors who are neighborly. And, and we promote shepherd model leadership. Nobody likes to work for a tyrant, right? No one. And we promote it in the church, too. That promotes freedom among Baptists in the church. We promote shepherd model leadership so that I can't call you up and say, you weren't in church last week. Where were you? I expect you to be there next week. I'm your pastor. I've spoken. Right? No, 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 no. That's not shepherding, right? Uh, render to God what is God's and to the state what is the state's. I've said it that way because we don't have Caesar anymore. He's been long gone. His plans failed. <laughs> okay. But we have, uh, don't, don't render to God what belongs to God. There's so many people worried about what the state is aligned with. I can tell you this, the state, <laughs> the state is not looking out for you. You're just a number on somebody's chart, okay? Uh, but, 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 but God and your neighbor will look out for you. If you're in the hospital, Joe Biden and Don, neither Joe Biden or Donald Trump are going to come visit you. I want you to know that. Um, now, if you're going to write them a billion-dollar check, they will visit you in the hospital. They will bring you a covered dish. Um, number four, serve a heavenly king. Serve a heavenly king. Right? Uh, we, we, didn't, we don't like James. We didn't like King James. We still don't like him, right? He's, he's mocked by Americans. We love to do it. Uh, uh, because, but we serve a heaven, heavenly king. We dare not mock that king who said what? To show mercy first. Who would, and thank God that he was merciful to us first. So this is, and then guard against the false freedom flags, I call these, because you get people, when people get fired up as patriots, first thing they want to do is go out and shoot somebody, you know. It's like, well, we did that in the revolution, but this is not the time or place for that, right? And they're constantly wanting to foment a new revolution, right? Uh, defend neighbors who are different. When you find out your neighbor's different for you, even if they annoy you, but they're still a peaceful neighbor, defend their right to be the curmudgeon they are. Or defend their right to be the weirdo that everyone else thinks they are. And just say, well, they're a little weird. But guess what? They're free. They're free to be that way. And unless they come in your house and start acting weird uninvited, then you call the police. That's different. All right? Now, and shun authoritarians. I have prayed prayers for in church, and somebody said, Bart, that prayer sounded so violent. Because <laughs> I've, I've done it since I've been here once. I was like, Lord, break the rod of oppressors. And authoritarians, Bar, what are you talking about? I'm, like, I'm talking about tyrants. Break the rod of the oppressor and the tyrant. Because I don't want an authoritarian over me. I don't need some government person come tell me what to do. Uh, I don't know about you, but we don't need that. If I'm behaving myself as a good citizen, they can go on away to do their business. All right, so shun authoritarians. You don't need them in the church or anywhere else. Good kingdom citizenship is good public citizenship. 
goes back to what? Number one, love your neighbor as yourself. That's how to be a good public citizen. Be slow to anger and swift to show mercy because who does that? God. And Jesus, the prime example of the one who was quick to show mercy and slow to anger. If you do that, you will promote freedom everywhere you go. I promise you will. And you'll be happier and you will stop shouting at your television. Because you do probably look foolish doing it. I know I do. Just stop doing that. <laughs> turn it off. Go turn on some old, go turn on Leave It to Beaver. I don't know. Something. Something old fashioned that's uh, unoffensive, okay? All right. Those are my that's my advice for you tonight. I hope that's good advice. Uh, let me say this as we go, and I'm gonna give you this blessing. And I think uh, consistent with with uh, religious freedom, go with this blessing of Christ. Render to God what is God, to the state what belongs to the state, and do this above all else. Love one another, and they will know who your king is. Amen. All right. Thank you.